Hi, epistemologists. So today we will be talking about the epistemology of peer disagreement. And this is part one of what will be a two part question. So we're starting off by introducing the issue today and we'll lay out some arguments for one of the views that's available. And next time we'll see somebody who proposes the other view about disagreement. You might be like, views about disagreement? You're telling me that people disagree about disagreement? Why, yes, they do. Welcome to philosophy. So in the words of Thomas Kelly, the question is, can one rationally hold a belief while knowing that the belief is not shared and indeed is explicitly rejected by individuals over whom one possesses no discernible epistemic advantage? So what's important is that we care about the kinds of disagreement that occur between what we'll call epistemic peers. Who are epistemic peers? Epistemic peers are those who are alike with respect to, quote, intelligence, perspicacity, thoroughness, and other relevant epistemic virtues, unquote. In the words of Gunning, 1982, you can find this quote on page 83 of that article. And Kelly adds, epistemic peers are also equals, with respect to their familiarity with the evidence and arguments which bear on that question. So we're discussing disagreement not just between like an expert and a non-expert, in which case it seems pretty obvious that we should defer to the expert, um, but not necessarily to the non-expert. So we want to discuss just cases in which two people are on a par. So suppose that you are a paleontologist and you disagree with another paleontologist. I am a pa Or suppose that you are a vet and you disagree with another vet about what to do about a kitty's health. Oh, God forbid you got sick, honey. Um, or suppose that you are a philosopher and you disagree with another philosopher. What is the right thing to do? This is, this is the issue we will be dealing with today. So should persistent disagreement among epistemic peers undermine the confidence of each party? So if I'm a philosopher and I learn that my other philosopher friend disagrees with me, should I change my belief to match theirs more closely? Should I hold on to my belief because somebody else disagreeing with me isn't a good enough reason to change what my belief is? Or should I do something else? So the available views that we'll be discussing this week are conciliationism, which is the view that those who disagree should reduce their confidence in the belief that they disagree about. So we should move closer together. We should conciliate. And then there's the view called steadfastness. According to steadfastness, mere disagreement is not a reason to reduce confidence. So those who disagree should hold on to their current confidence in their belief. So they should hold fast, hence steadfastness. Now, today we'll be discussing a paper by Thomas Kelly, which he published in 2005. And Thomas Kelly is actually going to defend a version of steadfastness. He thinks that just because someone disagrees with me, I shouldn't necessarily have to change my view. And so first he'll give us some reasons why conciliationism seems to make sense. And then he's going to give us reasons why those reasons aren't good enough, they're not convincing enough, and why we should be proponents of steadfastness instead. So, Kelly is steadfast about disagreement. He thinks he has good reasons to hold on to his belief, even if it turns out, and it will turn out, there are people that hold a conciliationist view about disagreement. People who think that if your epistemic peer disagrees with you, that's a reason to maybe change your belief or at least modify the level of confidence you have in your current belief so that you're not mismatched, you know, with respect to the fact that you're epistemic peer disagrees with you. So what are some reasons to be a conciliationist? What are some reasons to think you should change your belief in response to a peer disagreeing with you? Well, one reason is just that it seems intuitive, right? If I respect everybody who's my epistemic peer, as I should, at least intellectually, then if they tell me that they have gone through the relevant evidence and they've done the relevant reasoning, and they don't agree with me, even if that doesn't immediately cause me to change what conclusion I came to, I should maybe be less confident in my conclusion 
it seems intuitive that like someone just as smart as me, just as capable as me, just as thorough as me did the same work that I did, but they think something other than what I think that should make me worry that maybe I'm wrong. Right. Probably one of us got something wrong. That's the, that's the supposition. Now, Another reason to be a conciliationist is that it is actually motivated by a couple of philosophical views in other arenas. And Kelly gives some examples of these, including non-factualism and expressivism. And I won't describe them to you now, but basically it, it's, it, if you had those views, this would be an additional reason to be a conciliationist. Now, a third reason is a reason that we find in economics in economics research. So economics portrays becoming steadfast about what conclusion you've come to about what you should do um, or what you should believe as irrational. So e economists tend to think that if somebody disagrees with you and you are really stubborn and you refuse to change your mind or something, that makes you irrational. So economics tells us that if someone disagrees with us, we should maybe lower confidence in the thing that we believe that is a disagreement, that is a result of our disagreement or causes our disagreement. But Kelly points out that the economists are assuming that the reason this is irrational is that, you know, were I to then learn what the other person's evidence is, I would come to agree with them. So, so the economics cases, Kelly thinks, are not cases where both parties have access to the same evidence, which he thinks is the interesting case, not the one where you have some reasons that I don't possess, and that's why we disagree. That's a rational case of disagreement. We don't have the same evidence, so there's nothing to guarantee that we'll come to the same conclusion. But if we were to come to have the same evidence, the question is, would it continue to be irrational to disagree? Kelly thinks the cases in which we have all the same evidence, but we still disagree, those are the interesting ones. And in those cases, Kelly is not of the opinion that it's obviously irrational that these two people disagree. It's just like our paleontologist case, which we were discussing last week. It might be a case of difference of interpretation of the data. It might be a case of weighting the evidence differently. Um, and if that's not a part of the evidence, the weight that you should give the evidence is not a part of the evidence, then it seems like it might be possible to disagree. If you're a permissivist, it wouldn't necessarily be irrational to disagree. And notice, if it's not irrational to disagree, then it's not clear that conciliationism is required, right? If I'm permitted to keep hold of my own belief in the face of disagreement um, because, say, and this is what Schoenfeld thinks, my standards support my own conclusion, but not my peers' conclusion, there would be no reason for me to conciliate in that case. I should hold steadfast because I have my conclusion because of my standards, which are not shared by my peers. So the mere fact that my peer disagrees with me wouldn't be immediately a reason to change my mind or lower my confidence. Now, let's think about the case in which, you know, I have my own stupid little opinion and I learned that someone really smart, much smarter than me, much more of an expert, has spent a lot longer in the field, like disagrees with me. Kelly thinks that that case is one case in which it makes total sense to reduce my confidence in my belief. Like if an expert or an epistemic superior disagrees with me, like that makes my opinion look real dumb. So if I have a view that is against that of Dr. Anthony Fauci, like nationwide expert on infectious diseases, and I have a view about infectious diseases that disagrees with him, but I don't have an MD, I'm not that kind of doctor, <laughs> and I don't know about infectious diseases except what I read on Google, right, through a Google search, well, I'd be really dumb to continue to hold an opinion that disagrees with his unless I had like some other expert or something I was relying on. But basically I should defer to the expert. That is a case in which I should conciliate on Kelly's view. This, the same idea that I should defer to experts also seems to motivate my reducing confidence when an epistemic peer I share all relevant evidence with disagrees with me. That's the thought of the conciliationist. So if you agree about that 
defer to the expert case when he's, he or she, or they are not your epistemic peer, you think you should conciliate toward their view, why not say the same thing when somebody's your epistemic peer, right? This is not a case where someone is actually below you on the epistemic food chain. It's someone who's on a par with you on the epistemic food chain. So if there's gravitational pull, if they're above you, why wouldn't there be gravitational pull when they're at the same level as you? So basically think about it like this. You are my epistemic peer. So in that way, we're symmetrical. We have the same evidence. In that way, we're symmetrical. We are taking the same amount of time going through the evidence. Let's say that's symmetrical. And, you know, we're, let's suppose we're trained in the same field or we are aware of each other's methodologies or something. We're just basically on a par with everything. If the only thing then that we disagree about is what the conclusion should be, why shouldn't that mean that we should move towards symmetry on that as well, given that we're on a par with respect to everything else? Like in my personal case, why shouldn't I change my opinion so that it more closely matches yours? I mean, forget about what you should do. Presumably that's also what you should do according to the conciliationist, but why don't I, knowing that we have everything in common, not shift my belief or my confidence in my belief to match yours more closely? Why would your judgment, which is you know well thought out, not carry any weight for me? Now, this is the point where it makes sense to switch now to going full throttle on Kelly's uh, defense of steadfastness. So perhaps you agree that like all of these are good reasons to be a conciliationist, but are they decisive? So Kelly asks, why is the case, the mere fact that you disagree with me, a good enough reason for me to change my mind about what I believe? Isn't it at least possible sometimes that I am permitted to hold on to my belief when a peer and I disagree on the basis that from my perspective, it's them who made the mistake. Why should I have to sacrifice my belief if I don't think, given my evidence, that I'm the one who made the mistake? Now, if you like the conciliationist view, if you think that someone disagreeing with me given the same body of evidence is a good reason for me to change my confidence level and my belief, it must be because you think that skepticism is a little bit appealing here, right? The fact that we disagree either means that neither of one of us has it right or only one of us has it right. And what's my confidence level for believing that I'm the one who has it right? Kelly says an interesting thing in response. What is the difference between you're actually disagreeing with me in the present case and a case in which, you know, I'm going through the evidence and I ask myself after I've come to a conclusion, huh, what if someone disagreed with me? Are those two cases different? For Kelly, they're not so different because the problem is the very threat that I might have made a mistake. Now, in the hypothetical case, the worry is sort of one that just occurs to me. And maybe if I'm genuinely concerned, I can go over my work again, I can go over my reasoning again, and like double check, you know, make sure that I've been dutiful, and that I've come to the conclusion I've come to for the reasons that are before me kind of thing. And if, you know, you start thinking about the non hypothetical case, the one in which I genuinely have a peer who disagrees with me, Kelly wonders, why should I do any different? Why shouldn't I just have the same process where I say, okay, well, maybe that's a reason to go over my own reasoning, but if I don't find any fault with my own reasoning, surely that's not a reason then to change my confidence level in my belief. Kelly just thinks if the hypothetical threat isn't good enough for me to change my mind, then the real threat of disagreement shouldn't be enough to get me to change my mind either just because I can invent someone who disagrees with me doesn't guarantee that I've made any mistakes in my work. Similarly, the mere fact that someone disagrees with me doesn't guarantee that I've made mistakes in my work. Given what I know, what I have access to, my evidence, the conclusion that I've come to is the one recommended to me by my evidence. So Kelly thinks I should hold steadfast 
the mere fact that someone disagrees with me isn't a good enough reason to change my mind or lower my confidence. Maybe in some cases it's good enough reason to like double check my work. And perhaps in some of those cases, I will find that I've made a mistake. But before I know I've made a mistake, I shouldn't change my mind. The mere fact that someone disagrees with me isn't already evidence that I've made a mistake for Kelly. But maybe is it? <laughs> so now we come to what's called the higher order evidence argument for conciliationism. According to higher order evidence, the fact that someone disagrees with me is evidence. It's another piece of evidence. It's evidence about my evidence. So if someone disagrees with me for the conciliationist, that's evidence that maybe my belief is not reasonable. It can be uh, defeated. You know, there might be reasons to think that the evidence shouldn't have the weight that other bits of evidence have. But for the conciliationist, the fact that someone disagrees with me is evidence. What is it evidence for? Is it evidence for the belief or is it only confirming evidence for the evidence? So let me explain. Suppose Susie believes that evidence P supports proposition Q. For Pam, her friend, the fact that Susie believes P supports Q is meant to be higher order evidence that it is reasonable to believe Q on the basis of P. And if they share P, they share all the evidence P, then the idea is it's reasonable to conclude Q on the basis of P. And this is what the evidence is that Susie's belief shows Pam that Q is, is a good reasonable conclusion to come to. Now notice, and Kelly points this out too, it could be misleading evidence that Q supports P. Sorry, that P supports Q. It could be misleading evidence that P supports Q. Maybe Susie's confused and she got it wrong, in which case Pam would be misled. But it's still evidence, even if it's misleading evidence. Now, the main question is, is the fact that Susie believes that P supports Q also evidence that favors believing Q? Not just that favors that P is a good reason for believing Q, but that actually directly favors Q. Kelly says that you shouldn't list the fact that you believe as confirming evidence for the belief. That would be double counting. So why should I count it? Let me explain with a quote by Kelly. Quote, imagine that I have yet to make up my mind about H. Suppose further that I find that you believe H on the basis of our shared first order evidence E. If I treat the fact that you believe you as you do as an additional piece of evidence which bears on the truth of H, then I will, when I enumerate the considerations which tend to confirm H, I will list not only the various first order considerations that speak in favor of H, but also the fact that you believe that H is true. That I treat your belief in this way might seem to involve a certain admirable honesty or humility on my part. But notice that when you enumerate the reasons why you believe that H is true, you will list the various first order considerations that speak in favor of H, but presumably not the fact that you yourself believe that H is true. I am thus in the awkward position of treating your belief that H as a reason to believe that H despite the fact that you do not treat this as an epistemically relevant consideration. Aren't I essentially engaged in a kind of double counting with respect to the relevant evidence?" Unquote. So Kelly is saying that if I were to list all the reasons that I have for believing H, I would list everything in E, and you would list everything in E. But then we'd have a strange difference where if you listed all of the E's, and I knew that you concluded H, I would strangely list the fact that you concluded H among my evidence alongside all of E. So I would have this extra thing in my evidence base that you don't have. And Kelly thinks that's a little bit odd. I'm essentially double counting because you arrive at H because of E and we both share E. So if I add and also you believe 
H on the basis of E, I'm kind of like including all of the E already again inside that proposition. And Kelly thinks that that's not right. And so he just thinks that disagreement doesn't provide higher order evidence. He thinks that the main reason to believe, that is to say, the original evidence E, will remain the same even if you don't, sorry, even if you do want to count higher order evidence later. So all of the E will remain the same. And suppose later, like we're having a dispute about something else and you go like, oh, but you concluded H or something, that higher order evidence might be able to come into that, that dispute later. But my original evidence E will remain the same, even if I do bring in the higher order evidence later. But it shouldn't be already a reason for me to come to any one conclusion now. Only E should bear on the question of whether H, not E plus the fact that you believe H. So in summary, Thomas Kelly believes that the mere fact that a peer disagrees with me isn't a good enough reason to conciliate, either to suspend judgment or to change my mind about what I should believe, or even to change my confidence in what I believe. Kelly is straightforwardly of the opinion that the only thing that should determine what I believe is the evidence that I have. And he thinks that higher order evidence doesn't have the same status as first order evidence. And so it shouldn't bear on the conclusions that I come to that are, that they're supposed to be based on that first order evidence. And so it'll turn out that if the peer disagreement is about what the evidence that we share supports, Kelly just thinks there won't be a good enough reason for me to suspend belief just because you come to a different conclusion from me. So, steadfastness. Next time, we will talk about the other side of the issue. We'll see a view that defends conciliationism, according to which the right thing to do is to lower my confidence or to suspend my judgment about the question with which I disagree with my peer. Now, uh, just to close, because I think this is an interesting issue and it comes up in Kelly's paper, um, and I won't discuss it now, and I'll actually probably just link to another video by somebody else that discusses this. Um, I'm going to bring up the Newcomb problem. The Newcomb problem, or Newcomb's problem, says the following. Suppose that there's a predictor, some machine that knows everything about the future, call this the, the predictor, or is just extremely accurate, like 99.99999% with respect to what will happen in the future. Call that the predictor. There's a player, somebody playing this game, and there are two boxes. Call the boxes A and B. The player is given a choice. The choice is between taking only box B, say this is box B, or taking both boxes A and B. So you either choose B or A and B. The player knows the following. Box A is clear. You can see what's inside box A, and it always contains a visible $1,000. Box B is opaque, and its content has already been set by the predictor. If the predictor has predicted that the player will take both boxes A and B, then box B contains nothing. If the predictor has predicted that the player will take only box B, then box B contains a million dollars. The player doesn't know what the predictor predicted or what box B contains while making their choice. So again, box A has a definite visible $1,000. Box B has either no money or a million dollars, depending on what the player chooses. If the player chooses just box B and the predictor predicted it, then there will be a million dollars there. But if the player picks both boxes and the predictor predicted that, then there will be no money in box B. So which would you choose? Would you take only box B? Would you choose only box B? That's called one boxing. Or would you take both box B and A? We call that two boxing. And this problem called Newcomb's problem is directly related to the issue of higher order evidence. And I mean, I can't go over the ways in which it impacts all these different kind of tiny 
specific epistemological questions, but maybe you can think of some. One issue is, of course, it appears that lots of people have intuitions about the right thing to do for the Newcomb problem, and they are very, very divided. Each side seems to think that the other side is absolutely wrong. So we have a case, Newcomb's problem is an excellent example where trained experts disagree about what the right thing to do is. And presumably they share all the evidence. I mean, it's not, it's not like the thought experiment is that complicated to explain. And yet, there is disagreement. Would the fact that somebody disagreed with you about the Newcomb problem be something that would change your mind about what the right thing to say is? I mean, suppose that you're talking with someone who's an epistemic peer, not, not with an expert who's worked on the Newcomb problem for a long time. Suppose that it's, you're just thinking it through and you and your best friend happen to find that you pick the opposite scenario one of you is a one boxer, one of you is a two boxer. Would that be a reason for you to conciliate? Or would that be a reason for you to hold steadfast anyway? There's a question. All right, that's it. So we'll do part two next time. Thanks everybody for tuning in. Bye.